Welcome to the first in what I think is going to be a series of interviews with uh, people from various different organisations, activist groups, um, to talk about and explore some of the problems that exist in society and what some of the solutions for those problems might be. Um, today I've got with me Adam Maloney, also known as Adam Antium. Um, he's from the Zeitgeist Movement, he's been an activist for a number of years now, um, has given talks, uh, has a YouTube channel, um, goes out and does stalls in public, you know, sort of talking to people, offering free hugs, that kind of thing. Um, he's recently done a episode of Quantum Earth, which is available on IMDb. It's a multi-award winning show, which again, its purpose is to explore some of the problems facing the world and uh, what some of the solutions might look like. So Adam, welcome. Thank you very much for coming. Um, and tell me a little bit about what the Zeitgeist Limit is about and the sort of things that they uh, advocate for. The, one of the main ones is the, uh, the mathematical unsustainability of the monetary market paradigm, uh, which is really a system that is based on infinite economic growth and, uh, and consumption, but it exists on a planet of virtually finite resources. That sort of thing, it, it says to me that we're really... Doomed to eventual failure kind of thing. Yeah, it's, it's like we're heading towards a cliff edge and I see the ideas of science and sustainability uh, that they, the kind of advents that those things can offer actually in the realm of providing life needs and educating people as to the real reality of our interconnectedness uh, as, a, as a human species, a human family really to be steering us away from that profession, really in a, in a sustainable direction. So there's that one. Uh, there's also the, uh, the value system, uh, systems that we suffer and, uh, and endure and perpetuate in this system, being uh, rampant consumerism, which is further destabilizing de things. I mean, these are linked, aren't they? The, the sense of separation and the rampant consumerism to try and fill the hole caused by that sense of separation, right? I mean, these yeah. things are inextricably linked. Yeah, yeah, there's, uh, there's also the fact that the monetary system, it requires human labor. It's based on human-performed labor in order for people to be paid money to then spend back into the system. And that's being threatened by the natural evolution of technology, which we developed in the very first place to make our lives easier. The very the definition of the term machine is a labor-saving device. And when we follow that train of thought through to its logical conclusion, we realize that all algorithmic tasks, all algorithmic jobs as it were, that waste a human life, are actually better suited to machines. Mm -hmm. So we should let machines free us up from that life-wasting labor and you know, allow us to go towards heuristic tasks which are really uh, geared towards creativity and you know, that really stimulate and stretch the human, human mind and imagination. Do you think that transiting from where we are now to RBE in a series of steps is a realistic proposition and if so what do you think some of those steps might look like? It depends on what sort of things human beings can be uh, pushed towards value. If we can actually internalize and then radiate out the, uh, the positive values of society then that will hopefully start people asking the questions of oh, well, why, why can't we have it? Social system. Where so you're talking at a, at a grassroots level, sort of person to person, yeah. um, that kind of thing. Because I mean, I, I see no mention or reference whatsoever in mainstream media coverage of. I mean, I am the uh, show that you did recently, Quantum Earth. That's that's probably the most um, in depth, you know, widely available examination of RBE I've, I've ever seen, other than you know things like the Venus Project knocking out their own videos, but. Uh, you know, why, why do you think it gains so little? Do you think it? Do you think it is seen as a threat, or do you think it is still just a very, very tiny niche thing in the world? It's almost, it's almost on that precipice. There's, uh, I'd say, there isn't enough people that are advocating this, uh, this value system shift and this socio-economic shift to really be considered a threat. But once, once critical mass, as it were, starts to build then I guess in a sense it is contrary, it is completely contrary to how the current system works, so it will be seen as a threat. 
Uh, but I think that's why um, the, the radiating out of positive values is so important to say, you know, yes, to a certain degree it is a threat to the current establishment, but it's not a threat to humanity. Yeah. It's only a threat to the current system. Right. Mm -hmm. And in terms of like some of the steps that can be yeah that be taken uh, in that direction, I think potentially if if the Money Free Party does actually start gaining more and more traction and more attention, not just to its own manifesto as as it will create, but also the uh, the fact that no other political parties are talking about this, so that can have like a novel appeal that can really start propelling it out into the mainstream and you know that can build because politics is the current means by which societies are orientated managed and move forward then it just needs to be managed and move forward in the right direction so you think that the current political system could be employed to aid the transition you don't think that the political system as it stands would need to be Smashed apart. The idea that it, it, it could be adapted and used for not com not completely. No, the uh, the the as I said, the political system is still uh, the current means. People, you know, the the main thing that uh, that people say to to affect affect change is to vote. And if voting is towards political parties that do have this ideological bent of moving us forward towards sustainability, then that is that would be a point where I would start saying, well, yeah, I think voting can actually change things. If for no other reason that it gets it on the agenda, right? As soon as there's a couple of members of parliament, now they have to be recognised as, as something. But mm -hmm. then, of course, the first past the post system that we have in this country makes it extremely difficult. I mean, yeah. for a long established party like the Green Party, I and mean, I think they've only ever had one MP in the House of Commons, haven't they? Yeah, I'm, I'm not 100 percent sure that could be misinformation, fake news. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I know you know who Jacques Fresco is, the leader of the Venus Project. I don't know, have you come across Charles Eisenstein? He's a I've heard American heard well. philosopher, natural philosopher kind of thing. Um, both of those people say that society will simply not be prepared to embrace ideas as radical as money-free systems and RBE or whatever, um, until the current system is catastrophic, has, has, has to be seen to fail before people will be prepared to embrace new ideas. Do you, do you, to what extent do you think that is true? Well, I do, I do agree. To a certain extent, um, I think society does need to be shaken by the lapels hard enough for, to shake people out of the delusion of everything's okay. Being, be, of everything's okay in the current system. It's like, well, maybe not. You know, maybe there, it's maybe there needs. So, what, 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 what in your opinion, would it take? What, what would be a sufficient shake, in your opinion? It's, it's hard to say. I mean, the, I think. It, de it depends. I, I mean, personally, I don't want things to all completely go. I don't think any of us wants that. I'm just just question whether it's yeah. inevitable before meaningful change can come about. I don't think any of us want that. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, hopefully there will be certain organisations uh, and, char and charities that can come in as a as a social safety net uh, when things really start um, going off the cliff and. And it maybe it is that sort of um, that force that in that forced need to subsist on really what is charitable actions by volunteers, not by governmental agencies or governmental bodies, uh, for people to realise. Wait a minute, we, we can't just rely on this sort of thing. We need something better. You know, the it's kind of like you know when when someone is becoming more and more ill. There, there is a certain point where they realise, I can't even get out of bed anymore. But for, but for a lot of people, by that point, they're, they're so entrenched in a sedentary way of being that some of them might just go go down with it. So this is, this is why I think it's so important for us to advocate for a better way of being and a better way of living. Uh, so to plant enough of those seeds so that when people are really, really suffering, they go, I 
yes, we, we need a better system. So, um, I mean, would you would you say that it would be wise for individuals to start thinking in terms of a little bit more self-sufficiency, you know, start using their gardens to grow some food, stick some solar panels on the roof, you know, Absolutely. all of this kind of thing? Absolutely. We need to limit our dependence upon the current system. Not only will that, to a certain extent, slow the kind of cancerous growth of the system, Starve the beast. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, every person that doesn't use their credit card, every person that doesn't renew their iPhone at the end of the year is, is going some way towards starving the beast of its lifeblood, right? Absolutely, yeah. You know, we had economic growth of 0.6% again last quarter. <laughs> 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 it's like an oncologist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just like that. That's right, your tumor has grown by 0.6%. Congratulations. <laughs> That's the thing. That, that's, why these, that's why these kind of conversations are so important to show to show the complete turn. Absolutely, the inversion of, of so much of what we take for granted is, as this is how it is and this is how it must be because this is how it's always been. Mm. But also start to internalise more of an alternative value system in terms of how we socioeconomically behave. To say, well. You know, we shouldn't be thinking about things in terms of like global tra uh, global trade organisations and movements. Yeah, but how can we localise? Yeah, localise and then from the local level start to work yeah. out. Yeah. So it, to a certain extent there, there needs to be a big contraction in terms of, of our socio-economic scope to start thinking globally but then start from there building out and then acting with the yeah. with the thinking locally you mean that from that out yeah yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so well, how how do you see do, do you see um, things like civil disobedience demonstrations marches rallies do you, do you see these as effective means of getting them I mean we met actually at the Million Mask March didn't we a couple of years ago which is which is exactly that I mean it's a rally it's a march there's people there with placards and megaphones you you were megaphone in hand speaking as usual in a very calm and measured way but do, do you think that these things actually have an impact on those who are not already thinking about these things it depends i mean this is why uh, at the last million last march i was really uh, quite strongly advocating for people to march for something rather than against something I think not only when people are marching against something, not only does it create this really angry energy and something that the police can crack down on, but it, it almost indirectly sends a message to the public that all oh, these reprobates are really angry, or oh, let's just ignore them. They're not. They're they're just. They're just rebelling. Against. And then, of course, whatever they are angry about gets associated with reprobates, right? And therefore, not to be taken seriously. Exactly. Yeah. So I think as as long as uh, as long as something like a march or a rally, as long as it is advocating for something positive, and is uh, you know something where people are not afraid to get out and be identified as something that. Uh, something that is moving forward, uh, then I think that can help not just the crowd themselves manage themselves in a peaceful manner, but also put out a message to say, oh, people aren't just mar marching against something, they're actually for something. It gives people something to consider. Because yeah. one thing that takes hold during something like a million mass march is uh, the psychological term for it is de-individuation, mm -hmm. where people acting anonymously as part of a crowd get whipped up into a herd mentality and whatever dominant uh, energy that crowd has, that, that starts getting ramped up and unfortunately with a lot of marches and rallies, people are marching against something, angry yeah. energy and people just start shouting at buildings, they start shouting at police officers, mm -hmm. they start getting rowdy, the police feel they have to crack down on them and it just feels like a very counterintuitive yeah. Yeah. Uh, process. So even though the Zeitgeist movement explicitly is not a movement that uh, that considers rallies and uh, marches and demonstrations as a key uh, method of, of advocating it, I think you know piggybacking, piggybacking on those on those things to say yes, we can see your anger and we appreciate your anger, 
but that anger needs to be transformed into a proactivity where you go, okay, what would we, what kind of world would we like to live in? What kind of social values would we like to see advocated? I don't think, I don't think on the whole human beings really enjoy to live in that kind of angry, sort of um, combative and um, anti stuff, anti yeah. mentality. Yeah. I think if people are absorbed in a pro mentality, wherever that may be, then I think that actually does, if people come away, instead of thinking, you do what we told them, people think, I did some good work. Yeah. So I think, yeah, I think that can be nothing but a good thing moving forward. As, as long as there's, because, you know, we didn't have, there was, there was like a handful of, uh, of us who were RBE advocates in the march. Um, I think more and more people, as, as, as we start gaining critical mass, if we start getting enough people to say, well, yeah, there's enough people here for a march for, for something. something. Yeah, yeah and, that would be nice to see. And as long as it's not dying, that's, that's the thing about that. And there's a line, isn't there? I mean, where, where, does, where does shouting and screaming abuse of people turn into violence? I mean, that's, that's violent communication. You could argue that is in itself a form of violence, right? Even yeah. though it's not physical. Yeah, and, um, and it certainly engenders that kind of response in others. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I mean that, that's why uh, that's why I am and myself and the Zeitgeist movement, uh, you know, definitely appreciates the uh, the value of the Socratic method by asking people questions instead of just giving someone a piece of information. You give someone a piece of information. Uh, immediately, they're starting to think, okay, do I agree with this or do I disagree yeah. with it? And you know, especially with uh, with our current culture's black and white thinking about things, if it's something that doesn't quite jive with the social values they've been born around and raised and raised with, it's easy to just dismiss something. If, if, you, if you dismiss something, you don't even need to think about it. So it's easier to dismiss these information. But yeah. if you ask someone a question, they become the generator of the information itself. And a lot of times, a lot of people actually are kind of part, part of the way there. When they say, oh, well, maybe smaller government, or, you know, different, uh, more egalitarian uh, values in government. But then when we start to say, well, does the social value system and the socioeconomic system, does, does that also jive with those positive values? No. So, it's like, so we, we do need, like, more evolution in terms of our, of our social values and socio-economic values. And so it gives people something to go away and, and ponder on. That requires a great deal more skill to communicate like that though, doesn't it? I yes. Think it's, it's, you really need a lot more patience, a lot more skill, you need to really listen. So this is why things like debate, it, it can have a function as long as it's used well. Because I think any kind of debate or discussion, it should be about what is right. No, it's, it, should, it should be a search for truth, right? Not not a battle of ideologies, not not a not a battle between two or more individuals to see who's right and who's wrong. Yeah, this is this is yeah. not the point. It's about developing the understanding of everybody. Is, is what it is. Debate should be about, right? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so it's a process, not a not a outcome. Yeah. You see in America recently, the, the the midterms in America recently, how toxic. The language was between the two sides, you know, how they are completely unable, if you're a Trump supporter, how unable you are to talk to a Democrat, you know, there, 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 there's, there's this wall going up. To what extent do you see money as responsible for that? I know that's a bit of a bit of a leap, but to what yeah. extent do you see financial? Um, well, yeah, the, the, the stratification of society that money mathematically creates is is really instrumental in dividing people um, because so many, so many discussions and debates I see uh, really if it shows if someone happens to have a lot of money then that automatically discounts you from the discussion just because you're uh, you're fortunate enough to occupy a higher position in the uh, in the income 
and therefore you can't talk, you can't be, your voice cannot be heard if you have any sort of left-leaning views, you, 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 yeah. you, have no, you have no right to talk about those things because you're yeah. rich, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I mean, this, this is one thing that Russell Brand even, even faced, that because he happens to be a millionaire, because he's been successful in what he's done, despite the fact that he has had this huge turnaround in terms of his political leanings and his ideological advocations, Still, the fact that he has all that money, um, people say, "Oh no, you're you're a millionaire. What, what would you have to say?" So that that by itself creates creates a division, and you know this is why I ask those, those kind of people, "Well, how much like how much money like like what's the what's the bank balance uh, sort of level that?" You know, that separates someone Rich from poor. Yeah, someone who can or can't talk about. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, understand. Like yeah. How, like how What's the number? Yeah. Give me a number. Yeah. How <laughs> little money do I have to have in my bank for you to pay attention to what yeah. I'm saying? Uh, so, so yeah, that's is massively corrosive. And, and for another thing, the the very function of the monetary system, not only does it divide us, but it also pits us against one another because mm. we're. You know, even if we're working in sort of like similar, uh, similar economic services or uh, or providing uh, similar products, then the very function of the monetary system does say, well, you've got you've got to compete. You've got you to can't, cut costs. You've yeah. got to cut wages. You've got to yeah, absolutely. You can't you make can't people cooperate. work harder because if you're not going to do it, someone else is going to do it, and you're going to be out of business as a consequence. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so it uses. Uses that uses the the rich, uh, the rich classes to say, oh well, they're they're just privileged and you know they, um, you know they they're just supporting the system. The middle classes to say, well, they're they're the people who uh, who have all the responsibility foisted upon them. And then like the lower classes say, well, you don't want to be part of them. Yeah, do that's you? right. That's what George Carlin so, used to say, right? Yeah, the poor are there to frighten the middle class into working hard. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's. It's a, ma it's a massive um, divisive game that really does need to be outgrown. The money is subject to the Pareto distribution, right? So the 50% uh, of all the money goes to the top 1% of the people in the, in the distribution, and then this Pareto distribution applies across many, many, many things in nature. It seems to almost be a law of nature, right? And so, uh, and this is used to, I don't want to say justify, but explain as being somewhat unavoidable that huge inequities in wealth, you know, however hard you may try as a society to smooth these things out, it's, you know, you're, you're swimming upstream because it's, it's, it's almost a law of nature. So um, it seems to me one obvious solution to this is to not use something which is subject to the burrito distribution as, uh, mm -hmm. as a way by which to organise society because it's yeah. inevitably going to exacerbate inequality, right? Yeah, exactly. We we know that the Pareto distribution is in effect, and if if something is fundamental to how we acquire our life needs is subject to the Pareto distribution, then that by itself shows that we've. It's almost like the the Pareto distribution is a huge shark that we've just swam right into. <laughs> yeah. So we're going, wait, wait, we don't want to be in here. Yeah, we need to be swimming with the sharks, not through the shark's digestive system. So the the very fact of the Pareto distribution existing shows that wait a minute, we need to be behaving economically and socially in a way that the Pareto Preto distribution doesn't harm us, maybe even in certain ways that we can harness the Pareto distribution to to show. Well, the think about it in terms of ideas. The best ideas, the one, the ideas that are demonstrated. One percent of the people will have fifty percent of the best ideas, but then those ideas actually become the property and the benefit of everyone, right? Yeah. If if they are ideas that actually have a global societal scope in terms of its benefit, then the Pareto distribution does no harm mm. in that effect. In fact, it's an asset. So we need a social system that isn't threatened, and very much like a social uh, having a social system that isn't threatened by the natural evolution of technology to liberate us from labour. We need a social system that isn't threatened by the Pareto distribution. Yeah, absolutely. Who was it who said that? 
you have to pay people to do things they wouldn't otherwise do, or something like that. Yeah, they're, 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 the only reason people need pain is because it's stuff that they wouldn't do for themselves. Well, yeah, it's the. Uh, I mean, this one, this is some of the, uh, the sociological research that uh, they've been from. I think it was the University of Rochester in New York, where they were. Uh, there was some uh, some studies with. Um, uh, where they were uh, discovering different levels of motivation. There's like motivation 1.0 is sort of like the biological drives. Uh, Eat, shit, sleep, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, motivation 2.0 is like the intrinsic motivation, doing something for the joy of doing it. And then there's the motivation. And students have that. They, 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 they were shown to have that. Were they intrinsic yeah. motivation? Right? Yeah, they, yeah, they could uh, show like an actual joy. In just for fun. Just, oh, so like, playing, for example, would be an example of that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The very existence of play is a testament to the fact that we can be motivated to do things even for exorbitant amounts of time. Time completely goes Just because it's fun. Know, just because it's fun. <laughs> People say, I could do this all day. <laughs> yeah. um, but then there's motivation 3.0, which is the extrinsic motivation. It's like the if or, uh, like, you know, if you do this, we will give you this. Yeah. And that has actually shown to, uh, to only really motivate people to do algorithmic tasks that require no higher order thinking. It's just sim simple things like that. You're doing it for the good. So, you know, it's something that you can't really mess up and something that you could just go on autopilot doing. Mm -hmm. um, but when it's when that kind of motivation, that kind of extrinsic uh, motivation is applied to heuristic tasks that require creativity and collaboration, and, so, yeah. and collaboration yeah. especially with collaboration, it's shown to actually corrode that kind yeah. of uh, the motivation to do that. Sort of thing. So, yeah, that's right. Creative output actually goes down, doesn't it? As, as financial incentives go up, people feel more pressured to come up with something, and therefore those processes, whatever they be, those mysterious processes that produce that kind of work, sort of shut down, right? Yeah, yeah. The the people studied actually reported that because they were being paid for it, regardless of how much they were being paid for it, they they were reporting that the activity started to feel like work. Mm. And uh, mm -hmm. there was one uh, statistic that Tony Robbins gave out that uh, I think it was like 85% of people studied were actively disengaged with their job. So, 85%. Yeah. So they're just turning up for the paycheck, yeah. basically. Yeah, and, and, and it's, it's intuitive if, if you think about like this kind of system, they're kind of ridiculous tasks. That are, <laughs> that are given to human beings. Just so they can get a paycheck so they can go and spend it in curries or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, you know, cut out, <laughs> cut out the, uh, the algorithmic tasks uh, allocated to humans. Give those to machines. Let machines take care of the grunt work. And human beings can, can do so much more with the heuristic tasks and the creative tasks that they can start moving things forward in ways that we couldn't even anticipate before because for so long we have been like enforced to take care of all yeah. these things that waste our lives that that corrode our sense of, of motivation and corrodes our corrode our sense of self-esteem yeah so you're not you're not one of those people that believes that if you took the if you remove the need for people to work most of their most of their time, you you are not one of the people that believe that people would simply, that, you know, everyone would just be sat, sat around on their couches scratching their asses well, no, watching I mean, the telly. On the short on the short scale, in the, in, the, in terms of the short term, there will be a certain phase where people will go through where they'll go, oh, I don't have to do anything. Oh, oh, thank brilliant. God. Yeah. Oh, and and there there will be a sort of sedentary sort of phase, but after a while, that will become very very boring. And they will actually want to do something with it. Yeah. Because I think regardless of all this crap that the system throws at us and, and pours into our veins and down our throats and in our, and in our minds, regardless of all that, I think there's still a very, very powerful social incentive for people to not to just be around people, but also to positively affect people. I think People harm each other not because they really want to, but because they've 
they've been driven down and injured themselves so much that they feel they just have to get this out somehow because because violence whether it's structural or physical or emotional or sexual or any or any kind of violence it either like goes internally and it starts to fester and the, the person starts to injure themselves or they or they have to either they either do that or they have to find some way of just getting it out whether it's like you know beating someone up in the pub on a, on a Friday night, they're getting out some sort of aggression. So, so I, I don't think that's natural to, to human beings. That is the environment, the environment being violent to people, and people having to find some outlet for it. So, but, so would, you, would, you, would, you, would you say that that is in part down to what we said before about the people being forced to compete with each other, the monetary system actually forces people into a sense of confrontation. Yeah. Not, uh, confrontation is maybe a little bit too strong, but certainly competition and not always healthy competition with each other. But I mean, I think, I think most people would agree that competition, sporting competition, so long as it's, you know, done in good spirits kind of thing, it can be very helpful. It can bring the best out of people. It can, yeah, push them to levels that they would not be able to achieve on their own, right? And so competition of that sort can be, can be extremely good. But the, the type of competition that we're talking about, or sorry, that you were talking about, is, is that of it's, it's, it's a zero-sum game, so the more I have, the less you have, right? It's whereas competition in a sporting sense can be more than a zero-sum game. Both parties benefit. Yeah, sure, one wins and one loses that particular, that particular encounter, but both have benefited from the encounter because their skill level has been raised and they had a great time. You know, it was a thrilling match and they had a great time. You know, this, this is not a zero-sum type of competition. Yeah. And so it's that, it's that. Yeah, so sorry, I've, I've kind of got lost from my original question, but do, do, do you think it is in part that sort of competition that creates that sense of anger and, and violence and need to lash out at the world that you were just talking about? Yeah, it can do. It, it sets a social precedent of other people not being there with you and for you, but rather against you. Mm. So, um, depending on uh, different kinds of uh, jobs that people are in, the kind of fields that they're in, they see people in differing forms of competition. So, you know, the one thing that different merchants have if they get, if they're on a high street and they have a particular kind of shop, and then maybe they establish a good enough sort of uh, source of uh, allegiance to market share with them. And say, for instance, another shop opens up and it's the same kind of shop. Immediately, then, um, I mean, I, I see it with uh, yeah, a threat, right? Yeah, yeah. You, see, you see them as a threat, and you start, you know, thinking about them in disparaging terms. You don't see them as an ally that uh, that is, you know, because normally, if if you you are hanging out with someone and you find you both have the same interests, then you can just exchange ideas and you can just chat away and and it. You're not in competition mm. because you're in the same field. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in Enhancing time, each other rather than, yeah, absolutely. Exactly. And, yeah. you know, people can learn from each other in that sense. But in terms of uh, something where it's in, in terms of the market, then that person is your enemy. Yeah. It's, it's not explicitly. No, no, no. no. And, and again, enemy is probably slightly strong, but I absolutely understand the point you're making. Yeah, you're yeah. economic. And Correct, you're yeah. Economic yeah, yeah. Threat yeah. To your so it and if there's not enough customers for two shops, well, one of you ain't going to survive, right? I mean, it actually becomes a, a fight for your survival almost, and can become, you know, yeah, very now, negative now, in that way. Yeah. So, so many people uh, want to find solutions uh, to to the problems, but so many people think that the solutions means that you know voting for a different political yeah. candidate. But then I say seeing that it's something like, a bit more radical than that yeah exactly yeah. The, the kind of the kind of changes we need are far more fundamental than uh, than just changing the different uh, political puppet as it were on the stage but really finding a way to to use what tools we have to provide for human needs and if human needs are provided for then social stress goes down suffering social suffering goes crime. down crime goes down <laughs> Addictions yeah. to harmful addictions, yeah, absolutely. Exactly, yeah. absolutely. Um, 
What do you say to people that say that resource-based economics or money-free uh, societal systems in general are just the latest incarnation of Marxism and this is a, a neo-Marxist ideology designed to undermine the uh, existing existing structures? What, what, what do you say to that? Well, it's, it's understandable because that's really the only alternative that people, people are, are told about. People think if you're not a capitalist, therefore you have to be a communist or a socialist or some, some people say you're both, which is <laughs> kind of strange, even though one kind of leads to the other. But um, but yeah, one, one thing I say to people like that is that communism still had all the different, all the same sort of... Uh, Centralised power structures. Yeah, yeah, monetary systems. Absolutely. All that sort of thing. And really, communism never really considered the idea of why we shouldn't have money. Marx could never have conceived of the technological capability that would have existed 150 years after he was writing, you know. You know, the, the ability to actually create a high standard of living for every single person on this planet, even if we do go to 9 billion, you know what I mean? The, the, the technological capability to cycle enough water and grow enough food and so on without adversely impacting on the biosphere. It, it, it's actually within our grasp. We could do it with today's technology, right? I mean, this is, this is not some pipe dream of, of Asimovian future. I mean, this is, this, is, this is available to us right now with current technology properly managed, properly organised, right? Well, yeah. I mean, we, we can feed, we can feed the, the starving portions of the planet just with the food that we chuck in the bin. You know, so we are already growing plenty of food, and we haven't even started on the multi-storey hydroponic towers, you know, powered by yeah. geothermal energy, which has yet to even be started with. You know, there, there, there are all these, there are all of these massive potentials which we haven't even started to explore yet. And you know, coming back to the money thing, I hate to keep beating the same drum, but you know, there is no profit, is there, in sorting many of these problems out? That's why they don't get sorted out? It's actually there's a financial cost associated with building lots and lots of desalination farms, with uh, you know, building lots of solar, you know, turning deserts into solar farms, these kinds of things. There are there are large financial barriers currently to doing that. But uh, as Jacques Fresco would say, this is the wrong kind of question. Do we have enough resources to build these things? Do we have the manpower? Do we have the technology? Do we have the resources? If the answer to those questions is yes, well then let's mobilise them right? and get this middle amount of money out of the way. I don't know, sorry, I've been talking for a rather long time, but I don't know if you heard this story in America recently of the potholes. I can't remember which town it was. There hundreds of potholes on the roads in this town. And um, the trucks and the bitumen and the gravel and the work and so on were all standing around waiting to go and fill these potholes. But in the meantime, the mayor and the state were arguing about who was going to pay for this, right? Was it going to come out of the state budget or out of the city budget? And for the six months that they were arguing about this, hundreds of cars burst tires and snapped axles and so on and so on. And when they finally agreed to pay for it, the potholes were all fixed in a couple of days. You know, and so the, 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 this, this arguing over who's going to pay for it is just such a massive barrier to getting stuff done and progression. What you're pointing out is actually the fact of the hamstring of money. If, some, if something that benefits human beings requires money to move hands before it's actually done, then your, your system is a hamstring to things. Because that's only going to happen if there's profit to be made, and it may benefit human beings as well, but that's kind of secondary to the fact that there's profit to be made, because if it would benefit human beings, but there's a negative profit implication, then that's simply not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. No, we don't. Yeah. So, so yeah, I, I use that example to point out to those people. And um, and the thing is, but like as you said, like the resources exist, the technology exists, so there needs to be that shift. The the realization we're coming from is that of the the sort of the bottom up redesign of culture to say, okay, if we were given the choice and the task of redesigning a society. Then, uh, then you know, how would you go about, you know, using the current tools and the most effective tools that human beings have, uh, have created, not just uh, physical tools but ideological tools such as the scientific method? How do we go about designing a system that actually inherently values human needs and is inherently geared towards meeting those needs? So one of the one of the um objections, if you like, that I come across very often is that this is a naive and utopian view and is unachievable because it ignores basic human um, nature 
attributes, you know, the, the need to compete with each other, for example. Uh, people, people see it, the need to a, a acquire and to own things. People see these as, you know, parts of human nature and that to try and design a system that doesn't have these things in it is, is doomed to failure because it ignores, you know, the absolute, the absolutism of human nature. Well, what, what do you say to those sorts of criticisms? Well, for one thing, it's always the negative stuff that people tell as human nature. <laughs> yeah. when people, mostly when people talk about human nature, it's always either greed or warfare or, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, feeling of superiority. It's always the negative stuff. Whereas if we think about human behavior, human behavior reflects whatever that social environment requires. So if there's anything really that can be said concretely about human nature, it's adaptation and that there's predictable patterns of behavior when objective, objectively dem demonstrable human needs are either met or not met. Yeah, I remember reading somewhere the uh, Human, na human nature is to be very flexible in its nature, or some, something like that. I'm, yeah. I'm slightly misquoting, but yeah, that's, that's, that's essentially what you're saying, right? As human beings, we, you know, we're we're different in the sense that we have a cortex, which is the uh, the more the reasoning uh, centre of the brain that uh, that enables us. It's really the kind of like the, the centre of the brain that gives the wisdom for the knowledge that the other that the other parts of the brain can can handle and, and process. So, you know, adaptation, really, if, if you want to think about it in the Darwinian term, adaptation is what uh, what determines whether a species does survive. Mm. It's not survival of the fittest. It's rather... Survival of the most adaptable. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and again, back to something else that uh, I, I came across, that human beings are particularly susceptible to input from their environment because of the fact we are born so prematurely. I and mean, if you can compare us to other mammals who are born able to walk, able to see, able to, you know, seek out nipples straight away kind of thing, uh, human babies are utterly helpless because as we walked on two legs, pelvis is narrowed, as our frontal cortex is developed, head, birth heads got larger, and the combination of these two things, narrowing pelvises and larger birth heads, meant that we had to be born much sooner than perhaps we otherwise would have done. So, I mean, human babies are born really quite premature, which means that they are subject to influence from their environment at a much, much earlier stage of development than other mammals are. And therefore, the, the, sorry, it's becoming a bit of a long question, but therefore, the responsibility placed on the parents and the society at large for the early development of that child are enormous, right? Absolutely, yeah. And it's, in, in a lot of ways, it's surprising how we've been able to muddle through. So, uh, with, with so many things at stake in terms of our, of our survival, it's, it's amazing that we really have gotten through. It's, it, for one thing, it's a testament to how, how durable we are as a species, how much we can actually take. Uh, but yeah, you're right, the, the responsibility on parents is far larger than people actually do appreciate. The, uh, the influence uh, during our, what literally what's called our formative years. Our pre-linguistic first couple of years kind of thing, yeah? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, uh, and if we, you know, the, the idea is that human needs must be met at all points in life, and maybe in, in ter certain terms, especially, yeah. and more and more with more impact during those formative years. Because when, if if there are cer certain amounts of neglect or suffering during those formative years, then those have ripple effects, uh, you know, later on in life that you know that previously were unseen, but now are actually seen more and more. And it does give more credence to the idea that the social system that we have really does need to value those human needs and not to, you know, foist too much of a response. And not, not just value them, but even more than that, they need to be placed at the very, very, very... That and the concept of long-term sustainability, those two things need to be at the absolute centre of any social construct, right? Yeah, I mean, human, human beings, we are, the, we are the most socially mobile, and the most um, environmentally influential species. We have, uh, obviously, as I said earlier, the, uh, the innovations that we've got, 
um, allow us to put so much more of an impact mm. on the uh, on not just the social environment but also the ecological environment. So we really need to add values in our in our society that that recognise the the interconnectedness and symbiosis with ourselves and the environment. We can't deny that. With that great connection. power comes great responsibility, right? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. I mean, one, one, I know that one of the things that you do, I mean, we've known each other for a couple of years, but one of the things that you do is uh, you go out and put stalls up in uh, high streets and offer people free hugs, right? Um, so, what, what's the purpose of that? Do you, and, and two parts to this question. Firstly, what, what is the purpose of that? How does, it, uh, how does it go down kind of thing? And secondly, do you think that there's a danger that things like that might devalue the importance or the gravity of uh, the ideas that you're trying to talk about? No, not at all. I mean, the, the, the purpose of the free hugs really um, very central to, uh, to the, the free hugs campaign that was started uh, how many years ago uh, back in Australia. Uh, there was a guy who uh, was himself one man <laughs> and uh, he, he basically just started it and it was really just to, just to help brighten, brighten people's day. You know, the idea of physical contact and affection is something very uh, very central to uh, to the human experience, being a social species, the, the recognition that there are good people in the world that are willing to even look at a complete stranger and say, hey, let's, 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 let's have a hug. Let's yeah. have a hug. It's that, that connection, it really helps sort of like, you know, boost up uh, the you know, endorphins, serotonin in people's, people's system. And even, even if people don't come for a hug, they see it and, and even at and least it makes them smile. They smile. Yeah. And the very muscular act of the smile is, uh, is something that, that definitely does help. But, uh, but for the people, you know, the, the one question that I got the most when I was giving out the free hugs is why I do this. And for one thing, it's to help brighten people's day, but also the fact that they've, they've come in and they're now curious about why I'm doing what I, what I do. It, it opens the door to say, well, you know, we've we've shared a, a moment of uh, actual, like, you know, platonic affection, and uh, and we should really have a social system that really does value that. So mm. it definitely does open the door to discussing about resource-based economy and, you know, why why we should actually move towards that. So I I think it it definitely doesn't. Detract from the uh, from the movement's message to it. I think it's but actually uh, quite the, quite the reverse. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a uh, I think it's a very valid expression of that uh, of that new value system of saying you know very much like some of the experiments that I've seen that people do where they uh, they put up a sign uh, by their feet saying uh, you know I trust you do you trust me and they just put a blindfold on and just hold their arms out and people come up to them to hug. So it's a demonstration of how you know. Despite the uh, the, de the debate about some people say oh, it's human nature to be you know self-centered and greedy and, and all this sort of stuff, but no, human nature can express a whole range yeah. of things. Yeah, as you say, it's behavior, not nature, right? The the yeah, the, the nature is to express whatever behavior is necessary for the circumstances. Yeah, and out of that comes the propensity that people start having to. Uh, having to apologise to themselves for, you know, implementing different kinds of underhanded tactics mm. and cutting corners and, you know, um, breaking their own moral codes. Yeah, which by which by themselves without that other they would shot, never do. They wouldn't. Yeah. They wouldn't have needed to do. But because they were there, they needed to do. It. So this this is one of the big disagreements that I would have with anyone of a of a capitalist perspective. Uh, when I say that, uh, where is the guarantee that the system can ensure everyone has their life needs met instead of everyone having to compete with each other in to yeah, break in enough yeah. of the enough of the market share to say, right, well, I'm all right, Jack. Oh, never mind about you, but I'm all right, Jack. And it's that is really... Important. Interestingly as well, you must have seen these kinds of videos online. Interestingly, it seems to be that people who have experienced poverty themselves are far more generous 
than those who have never experienced it. You know, there have been these social experiments to go out on the street, give a couple of burgers to a homeless guy, and then none of someone comes along and says, oh, I haven't eaten for a couple of days, I don't suppose you'd share your burgers. And they, you know, the, 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 the guy living on the street will happily share one of the two burgers he's been given, but you go around and ask people sitting in cafes and restaurants for a few pence for, for a burger, and you just get nowhere. So, you know, I, I, find, I find that very interesting that those and it seem like this, these are tiny samples, I don't know if one can generalise from them, but it does seem on the face of that that people who are much lower down in the economic strata, uh, in the economic stratification, are more inclined to be generous with what little that they have. Mm. I, I find that to be an interesting contradiction. Yeah, it's, it, it completely flies in the face of what we're taught in terms of, um, of how giving we can be. The, when the dominant ethos is that you have to be out for yourself, the, it, it kind of reflects on uh, biological uh, survival, where the, le the less you have, the more protective you are. But when there's the human con uh, when there's the human recognition of how the system itself enforces that kind of inequality and suffering, then as then as you said, you know the, the lower classes. I can't remember the exact statistics, but the uh, the people who are in the lower um, the lower economic classes actually, on average, give far more to charity right. than the uh, than the people in the in the higher so social structures. Yeah. You know, so you think that's because they're more aware of the need, because they feel it themselves in their own daily lives? Do you think it's that? Partly, I, partly that. And, and it's also because the, their, their consciousness is zeroed in completely on what it's like to have nothing. And as, as I said earlier, I think the, the kind of social propensities we have, the social connections we have, um, help inform us to, to thinking, well, I know what it's like to have nothing. I don't want anyone to have less. Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we even see this happening in, in like higher social status where yeah. people say, I want, you know, a better life for my children than I, than I ever had. Mm. But the, the, the difficulty there comes with they're seeing it through the frame of needing to compete in a marketplace or in a particular kind of study of a career against other people. So, you know, the, the focus needs to, needs to be brought down to the society itself, to how human beings cooperate and work and work together. And when we do work together, as I say, many hands make lighter work. So that's, that's where the focus needs to be. Not on what we do for money, but rather what we do for humanity. Okay. Well, I think that's probably a pretty good spot to end on. Um, so, uh, yeah, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.